Good evening Cebu, good evening Philippines. It's open mic night tonight and tonight we are privileged to have a world-class chef, a world-famous chef, a Michelin-starred chef, uh, none other than Jason Atherton. Jason, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for inviting me. And welcome to Cebu. Welcome to Cebu to your restaurant. We'll talk about your uh, newest venture here in Cebu uh, later. Walay sapayan, <laughs> which you know, oh. which you know, and it's not a very common. Uh, it's not very common anymore to say you're welcome uh, like that. Walay sapayan. Well, my wife teaches me the correct way. I hope because you are married to a Cebuana. Yes, yeah, that's why I'm here. Yeah, that's why I'm in Cebu. I hear, um yeah, we met 15 years ago in, in Dubai, uh, even though she kicks me under the table every time I say that because she, <laughs> she thinks I'm uh, showcasing her age. But I tell you, she, she looks so beautiful, so it doesn't she matter. Is. Right? is she a model? Uh, I think so, part time. Because she looks <laughs> like a model to me. She her, told me anyway. His wife Erha is here uh, in the studio with us. <laughs> um, Okay, I, w I wanted to ask about your wife uh, later uh, in the third segment, but now that you mention her, uh, and of course, you are a chef. Uh, First and foremost. Does important. she uh, does she cook for you? A little bit. <laughs> her mum's a very good cook. Her mum's a very good cook. Yeah, yeah. What's so your... I bypass the question. Do you see that? <laughs> so I know what's coming next. <laughs> does my wife cook Filipino food for me at home? Yes. Uh, from time to time. What's your favorite Filipino dish? Um, probably... I have so many, you know, I, 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 I okay, lechon kawali, because I love the fact it's braised and then it's shallow fried, mm -hmm. I love that, the way that it goes really crispy and glutinous at the same time, it's so delicious, I like the green papaya salad, because we, we, we only get okay. ripe, we only get That's ripe right. uh, fruit back home of the mm -hmm. tropicals, so, so eating it in a raw state like a vegetable is really interesting for me as a chef, with a fermented fish, because I love that uh, right, uh, yeah, really, yeah. really like yeah. uh, sharp taste, uh, I love fresh lumpia, Fresh lumpia, yeah, which yeah. is uh, it's it has Chinese origins, I guess. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. But I mean, it's the first time I discovered it was here. So I'm a big fan of Cafe Lagoon. I go there most. Oh. Of the so when I'm working in the in the restaurant at the palm, the pig in the palm, I, I I'm in my chef whites. I think everyone thinks I'm a bit crazy. I, I run around the corner and have a little bit of Filipino food, and then go back to the you kitchen. Get, and you get to Cafe Lagoon. Uh -uh. You know, um, I was at Cafe Lagoon. I was telling our friend Randy. Randy, uh, he's a fan of yours, Randy Del Valle. Thank friend, you, Randy. Friend of mine with his wife Christine. They they're based in London, and they're you know when they learned that you were coming to the show, they said they have to be here. I said, of course, come to the show. Uh -huh. They love your burger. Uh, it's the best burger in London. Yeah, I was a little social one, right? Okay, great. My fan club is massive now. It's my mum and, and these two guys. <laughs> so I was just telling them last night, the Cafe Laguna, speaking of Cafe Laguna, I was there when they opened the first day because my grandfather and the Urbinas, the, the family that owns Cafe Laguna, they go a long way back. Mm -hmm. Tagalogs who moved to, to Cebu. So, and look at where they are now. They're very successful. So I'm very sure I'm a, I have that luck. And I was at the opening of the Pig and Farm. So. <laughs> Ah, well, fingers <laughs> crossed. <laughs> so, so you like fresh lumpia. Have you ever tried to uh, whip up something Filipino inspired with a taste, uh, with a touch of Jason? Yeah, of course, absolutely. On the menu at the Pig and Palm, actually, we, mm. uh, I love kinilau. Oh, okay. So I, I love the flavors. I like the fresh what coconut. What kind of kinilau? Uh, well, I've, I've mostly had it with uh, tuna. Okay. I've mostly had it with milkfish. Um, uh, but what we've done at the restaurant is, what, the way we would serve shellfish in the, in the restaurant back home is we would blanch, always blanch it. So what I mean by blanch it is boil it for 30 seconds in boiling water so the protein on the outside would set, but inside it's still pretty raw because they're so tender. Okay. So we take your local shrimps here, what are caught on the island of Mactan, and then we, uh, we blanch them for 30 seconds in their own natural water. Um, and what I mean by that is we take off the structure from the outside, the shells, we roast them, put that into boiling water so it flavors the stock, and then we quickly blanch the, the shrimps in there for 30 seconds. And then we make a classic kinilau uh, dressing with a touch of Jason. So the touch of Jason is uh, fresh uh, red onion, a little bit of chili, um, a little bit of uh, green mango. Okay. And then so when we've chopped all the shrimp up and we've made all the dressing with a little bit of calamansi and the datu putti, oh and we, we, we uh, <laughs> combine all that together with a little bit of uh, uh, chopped coriander, and then we put it in little scallop shells and serve it on ice. 
So that's my little wow. bit of a, a, a Jason uh, Filipino the chill out. Jason, a touch of Jason. Yeah, people love it. So you make me, you're making me very hungry already. To, to do this, uh, have you been to our markets? Of course, because I know chefs, they really go to the markets. Absolutely, yeah. Of course. I mean, every, everywhere in the world I go, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm obsessed by food when we're not in restaurants. We're eating other people's restaurants when we're on holiday. It's all about where we're going to eat, when we're, uh, you know, which hotel we're staying at, what restaurants does it have. So, you know, when we go to Sicily, uh, already we're going down to the Bacchino farm, which is a, a tiny little tomato mm -hmm. farm in the southern part of Sicily, because I want to taste the best tomatoes in the world. Where, you know, we'll be going on a couple of trips with our little kids to go and see the vineyards of Mount mm -hmm. Etna because there's a certain wine we had when we was in Milan that I want to go, it was so sensational, I want to go check out the, uh, the vineyard. And it's, a, um, to me, all that's part of my life. I don't feel like I have a job, I have a lifestyle. And I'm very thankful to God that he gave me this passion and this gift to be able to do everything I do. Because it allows you to immerse yeah, you know, in, yeah, absolutely. In, in the culture. And, and so when I'm here in the Philippines, of course I want to go to the market. You know, I go to Carbon Market. You go to Carbon. I go to... Uh, Basil. Yeah, absolutely. Basil yeah, I go to the board. fish markets. Um, everything. Just to I'm see very it. familiar because I, I, I do our family's marketing. I go, yeah, myself. With, yeah. Without yes. an assistant. I'm very proud to say. <laughs> <laughs> so you go there at dawn because mostly yeah. in Pasil, uh, the, the labas, no? labas the, the fresh fish, uh, they, they, they're there at dawn. Yeah. And it's, you know, it, it, it's because I have to see what's going on. Everything on, the, on our menu at the Fig and Palm is, is based around the fresh produce of Cebu. Cebu. So I, I have to understand and immerse myself in the, in the culture of what's familiar. Of course, I'm not going to serve Cebuana food. Uh, at the pig and palm because that would be strange because why would people come to a famous chef's restaurant to eat the food they would eat every day anyway exactly what they want to do is is understand my talent and what I do and what I can do with their local produce to turn it into my food that's what makes the pig and palm exciting so that's what we do that's really good and we're very thankful to the uh, the you know Carla is here Carla Jung mm -hmm. uh, McCohen and uh, she's your partner uh, because they're bringing the world to Cebu and uh, and uh, we have become already a melting pot no? of, of, of diver diverse cultures and uh, interests. But uh, this is really an addition that is more, more than welcome for us, uh, the Pig and Palm. And I think it's, everyone's excited because I heard you're always fully booked. Well, yes, yeah, so far, but we're still <laughs> a baby. Fully booked so since Monday. Yeah, yeah it's, pretty, uh, it's pretty, but with that becomes great responsibilities, you know. So, so it's fantastic. We get all this, you know, fantastic media coverage. Everyone's really excited, and, and Cebu has embraced what we have as, as, as a business and, and mm -hmm. an enterprise. But with that, becomes great responsibility. So our, my job now is, and the team's job is, to make sure that we don't let the Cebu public down, and obviously the wider Filipino public. We want them to come here and and be super proud of the restaurant, what we're doing together to help, you know, just. Give a great restaurant to Cebu. It's really exciting. I've seen on TV how you know there's a lot there's a lot of reality shows. There are a lot of reality shows that you know that, uh, too many. The focus on on chefs no? and, and, and and cooking and um, and I've seen movies like Burnt uh, with Bradley Cooper and it can be very tough to be yeah, to be a te to be a chef, especially if you reach a certain level like you have, you know, and uh, your restaurants have earned a Michelin star. Yeah. Um, are you stressed? Every constantly. day, every day. I mean, every do you day. like shout in the kitchen? No, I don't shout. I, 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 I get upset when people don't treat ingredients with the same respect yeah. as I do. Because, you know, whether it's, you know, I mean, you can imagine, right? So you've got a piece of beef, what costs a lot of money. A, a beautiful steak, say, Prefecture Wagyu beef from, uh, from uh, Prefecture in, in, in Japan. And this steak's probably cost 40 pounds yeah. or, 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 you know, uh, uh, 14,000 pesos or 40,000 pesos to just without even cooking it. Right? Okay. And then you've got a, the humble carrot, which has been grown by a farmer exactly the same, and it's worth five pesos, right? And people treat this carrot with disrespect, but they'll treat the beef mm. with respect, just because it has a it's monetary value. Yeah. But that's wrong, because they're both ingredients. They're both fresh ingredients. They both should be treated with the same respect and the same care and attention with every single product that comes through your kitchen because it's your responsibility as a chef to your, to your customer and also to your profession as a professional chef to make sure that everything you touch is right. And if it's not right, then you have to put it right. And that's the philosophy we live by. That's such a beautiful insight. You know, I, did, I never saw it like that, but you make, so it, for me, it's, it's become very clear now that being a chef is really all about leadership. 
Absolutely. Because well, even well. in political uh, leaders, that should be how it is. That you don't, you know, you don't favor a certain segment just because they're more well off over those who are, you know, so it's, so it's really a matter of leadership. Absolutely. Uh, and, and leading a, a huge team. But uh, how was it, how is it working for Filipinos? Because I, I know I've worked with a Michelin star chef. Yeah. She's actually Filipina. She, she, uh, she lived in San Francisco and she was here for a while. And I was working in a hotel a few years back. So we, co we had a lot of, you know, we collaborated a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, she would complain to me how she noticed that, uh, I don't know if, uh, if you've noticed this, that Filipinos, when they're abroad, they are, they, they're, just, they're just the best, uh, you know, uh, at what they do. They're hardworking, very precise, uh, and the quality of their output is just top notch. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. My, my, my wife's a professional shopper back in London. <laughs> <laughs> she, I think she's rated number one on chip advisor right now. <laughs> so she, she, she flies the, the Pinot flag right away. <laughs> you, have to, you, you have to take a shopping. With that, <laughs> <laughs> with that uh, when they're here, before they leave, it seems like they're, they're not like that. Uh, so she was very frustrated working with the, the, you know, the cooks and, the, and everyone in the kitchen when she was here. And they were very different from the Filipinos she used to work uh, I mean, I mean, back you know, in the I States. Mean, I think if you look at... The way I look at myself, it's very easy to be critical of, of, of someone else, Jun, mm -hmm. when you're, when you, um, you know, I've been cooking for 29, 30 years, so it's been a long time since I've been 16 years of age, and it's what I do and um, the way I perform in the kitchen becomes second nature to me, okay. so it would be very easy of me to be super critical of other people, especially junior people. I mean, senior people, you have to be because they're in a position of power. They accountability. Have, yeah, accountability, exactly, that's a great word. But with the junior people, it's our job to train them, no matter what you think of them. And I always say this to all my guys all around the world. Each country has its own unique uh, culture, its own unique Sensibilities. Uh, yeah, the, way, the way they deal with each other. And it's our job to fit into that, not their job to fit into the way we are. What our job is, is to make sure that our standards, when we serve food or we serve people, is the same way we do globally, not just here in the Philippines. We don't drop our standards because we're here in the Philippines. We don't drop our standards because we're in Hong Kong. We mm -hmm. don't drop our standards because we're in London. Our standards are our standards. It's an internationally recognized standard of what people would like their way, their food to be served. And if, if, you just, if you're just going to go to another culture and criticize that culture, then you, shouldn't, you don't deserve to be there because it's your job to you know, do your job correctly. That's all, nothing more. So, so for me, I look at every single way as a challenge to make things better you know what's your method in, in trying to bring out the best in your staff some people instill fear some people no, leadership I mean you know leadership I mean a simple thing like three days ago two days ago sorry I cooked um, I cooked staff food for, for the guys you know mm -hmm. uh, not for the senior guys for the young cooks the, the pot washers those guys and I cooked them a lovely lunch uh, made sure we we had rice because I know it's very staple for everybody mm -hmm. um, cooked them a, a, a lovely pulled pork uh, uh, dinner with pickled red cabbage avocado mayonnaise rice and I did it myself you know and, and it was uh, with barbecue sauce and, and every single one of them came up afterwards and, and, and thanked me and shook my hand but that would never happen in London they would just have eaten it they said of course I'd say thanks but they were so thankful, so happy, and it was quite humbling. It's very really, Filipino. Yeah, very Filipino. We're very, very warm, humbling. very hospitable, and yeah. very grateful people. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's how you win the respect of your people. If I stand there and shout at them and then don't feed them, what sort of respect are they going to have? I mean, okay, you might win them over by fear for a few days, but actually, reality is they go home and people don't really respect you. What they really respect you is by not wanting to let you down. Do you mean? So if they do a job for you and they do it badly and they've got themselves to blame because they've not tried hard enough, the guilt of that is much greater when you respect somebody so much and you really want to do your best for them than by living with fear. Does that make sense? Perfectly. So that's, that's, that's how we run our kitchen. Perfectly. We'll talk more about food and Jason's journey to where he is right now when Open Mic returns from the sh short break. Back here in Open Mic with Jason Atherton. So Jason, you've, uh, you have uh, restaurants in Dubai, Melbourne, Singapore, 
uh, but th there was in yep, Singapore, was, yep. and in Shanghai, Hong Sydney. Kong, Sydney. yeah, Sydney, uh, uh, London. of course, London and, yeah. and New York, and now Cebu. Yeah. So we're very proud to be a part of those uh, very global cities. Mm -hmm. um, and then you you also appear on TV. You know. Uh, yep. You co host bit. you co host uh, My Kitchen Rules, and yep. and you've also been a guest judge in, in several shows. Yeah. And uh, you've also won competitions. On TV, right? Yep, yeah, yep, yep. I, I won a program called Great British yeah. Menu, which is a um, it's a very serious chef's program back in the UK, um, where um, they pick 20 of the country's top Michelin star chefs to compete against each other, and you have to get four. Uh, there's four dishes up for grabs on the okay. banquet, and it's normally for uh, uh, they they create some sort of huge banquet at the end of it to mm -hmm. celebrate something. Yeah. We've done everything from the Queen's birthday. Wow to um, they invited all the top chefs from around the world that was a particular show particular series i was in and i was the only chef in the history of the in the history of the 12 years it's been on air to get two of his dishes onto the banquet wow so i got started with makers wow. and then they said would you come back and repeat the next year and i said no why not in case i lose so i went out <laughs> on the top yeah that's right i went out on the top <laughs> That's like a, that's like I learned that thing. That's the only Watching way to go. loads of good, really good pop stars, really good footballers. Get out when you're in. The, get out when you're ahead. <laughs> so yeah, I make this enumeration of uh, you know um, your obvious achievements because uh, I wonder how it was for you growing up, and did you ever envision yourself, uh, you know, becoming a chef like you are today? Uh, with the restaurants in some of the you know most co cosmopolitan cities in the world, mm -hmm. uh, winning all these awards, uh, your restaurants are getting getting uh, Michelin stars. Um, did you ever see yourself? No, gosh, I think I think you know I've always said this to all my young cooks. If, if, if you want to get into this program, uh, program if you want to get into this uh, life as a chef because you want to be a TV star or you want to be writing cookbooks or you want to be interviewed all the time or. All the stuff, what's for me, is just the fluffy stuff on top, right? Icing on the cake. Yeah, yeah. You need to be in love with food because all this doesn't exist if you're not great at what you do, right? Mm. It's like the whole world wants to interview Lionel, you know, uh, uh, um, Messi from Barcelona yeah. or Cristiano Ronaldo from Real Madrid. Why? Because they're the best footballers on the planet, right? Because they love football. Because mm. they've been playing football mm. since the age of three years of age and they're just crazy about football and they train athletes just to be a great footballer. They don't interview them because they're yeah. you know, good looking so, guys or whatever, it's because they're great at their job and that's why I always say to young chefs, be in love with food and let the rest take care of itself. Are you saying that um, when you were young, you didn't envision all of this fame, this uh, success, but that you always loved food? Always, never, never in my, even, even when I was working in some of the best restaurants in the world, I still never dreamt that I would own my own restaurant. It was never about that. It was only ever about cooking. Cooking, yeah. Just being on the stoves every day. And cooking going. and seeing people eat your food. Yeah, it was just the best feeling in the world. And, and then... Did, when did this start? Does it help that your mom, I know, was a hotelier? Yeah, yeah. So mom had a hotel when I was a, a young boy. And so I was always around... Of course, around, the F&B. Yeah, <laughs> so I was always around hospitality and always... It was a very small little bed and breakfast, nothing okay. fancy. But that's, uh, those are lovely, very yeah. quaint, yeah. And, and you know, she cooked all the food herself, everything was homemade. Uh, she's, not, she's not the best cook in the world, but she's a, she's a good cook. And, and, and um, we used to have to, me and my sister used to have to help her make food and, and prepare vegetables and wash up and, mm -hmm. and clean and help make beds and all the stuff that's what true. makes people happy when they're in these type of environments. So hospitality was always a big part of my life. So it was very natural for me to fall into it. What was the first dish that you cooked that made you decide, that, hey, I really want to do this for a living. I want to do this for the rest of my life. Um, I'd already decided that before I actually physically cooked a dish from start to finish because I knew from the age of 13, I wanted to be a chef. Mm -hmm. um, and I always wanted to be around food. So, and I'd the age not, of 13? Yeah, and I'd not- Before really, that. <laughs> Pardon? Before that, when you were 12, what did you want to be? Oh, same as every British guy, a footballer, right? But <laughs> it's like, I was never going to be David Beckham, that's for fact. So I, uh, I, I just, I just, you know. So at the onset of puberty, you decided you wanted to be a chef. Yeah, yeah, which is, not, you know, in the UK, it's not very manly, you know, because, you know, at that stage in the 19, gosh, 1982, 83, it was, you know, the middle of the 80s, it was, you know, Britain was a, a, a tough rumble type place from the north of England mm. where guys don't really cook. <laughs> Do you know? 
Uh, and then all of a sudden I popped up and, and told my parents I wanted to be a chef. It was all a bit weird, you know. Uh, but I stuck at it and, you know, thank goodness I did. Do you remember the first uh, person you fed whose facial expression just inspired you? Um, actually, like, probably, I, uh, I can say this because my wife popped out of the toilet, is, is <laughs> the, um, I, one of my first girlfriends <laughs> was, uh, I'd learned to do these two dishes uh, uh, back uh, down in London uh, when I was working for Mark and White. This beautiful langoustine terrine, so it's a little bit like your prawns, but, but they're really tender, uh, uh, with citrus and, and, mm. and lemon jelly and stuff, and it was just the most beautiful thing. So I made, a, I went to all this effort to make this terrine. Uh, and then I did this really amazing John Dory dish. I bought all the ingredients up from London because you couldn't get it in the small town where I was from. Uh, cooked this amazing uh, meal for her, uh, chocolate souffle, the whole thing. It was like it was like sensational. And because she didn't understand why I worked so many hours, because she'd never been to London in her life mm -hmm. before, she didn't really understand what, why we crazy people working 18 hours a day, six days a week, barely getting any sleep. Okay. Uh, and I took a week off and I'd gone up there, uh, gone up there and I tried to impress her and, and, and stuff. And, and when she'd, she'd never eaten food like that before in her life, when she'd eaten, she was like, wow. You know, and to watch someone. So the proof of the pudding is really yeah. in the eating. Yeah. <laughs> We're didn't talking about his ex, sorry. It didn't last, it, it didn't last, it didn't last very long. Uh, it didn't last very long. So the food was not enough. <laughs> the food was not enough, but the reaction was but it's reaction. forever. It's a reaction. What it, what it relates to is the reaction of someone who's never been exposed to that quality of food before. Did, did Irha ha, ha, have, have the same reaction? Well, no, because when Ira worked for uh, Gordon <laughs> Ramsay, when, like I did, uh, Ira used to um, steal all the uh, apple tart tans after services, this beautiful apple puff pastry <laughs> uh, with lemon. And because I, was, because I was in love with her so much, I used to let her do it. And she didn't know at the time. <laughs> Is she, is she jealous? Is she a jealous wife? No. Uh, does she demand uh, from you the same way you demand from your, from your kitchen staff? No, 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 she's great. I mean, I'm very lucky because my job is very demanding. You know, to, to, if, if, if I had a demanding wife and a demanding job, the two don't go hand in hand. It was very sympathetic for the fact that my, uh, my life is, is, of course, about my two beautiful children and, and, and my wife. But also we have to integrate the fact that you know we have to work really hard at our restaurants and you know we're both business partners together in the business and mm -hmm. and it's and it's a tough life when you when you look when you peel back the layers of what we have to do to achieve what we have to achieve. But it's like everything in life. I don't believe there's the perfect work-life balance. It's just something you make work, right? I mean make it work. I've always said that God gives us a bag, right? And you shake your bag around, you look inside it, and you get on with it. Because there's, there's, everyone's always gonna complain about something. What's your favorite dish? Oh my god, she'd have to ask her. What's your favorite dish, babe? <laughs> Anyone. She, she's crazy about Japanese food. So we just launched a Japanese restaurant in London called Shasharu. And, Which is the only um, one that you haven't tried. Yeah. The only one, right? Mm. <laughs> it's great. But how is it that she keeps her figure? I and mean, she's know. married to you. How is it possible? But, but most, <laughs> most Asian ladies actually, and most Asian people in general, age really well compared to, 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 to Westerners, you know, and, and, uh, and my wife's you know, also. You know. <laughs> so she's, <laughs> anyway, um, uh, you were mentioned, you mentioned that uh, what you made for your ex that, you know, that really garnered that reaction from her. It was made. But I was 18, right? yeah. I was a baby. It was like a uh, prawn and, and, and citrus. Yeah, like a language thing, citrus tree, yeah. 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 Um, so it's not true that, uh, there's this uh, there's this myth that if you eat shrimps or prawn and you mix it with vitamin C, it can cause poison. Oh really? <laughs> yeah, there's it was a hoax that was being spread. <laughs> but anyway, uh, <laughs> I'm never heard of that one. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I don't think I don't think she's dead anyway. I don't know. She may be she may be dead somewhere, and I just maybe it just never got traced back to me. <laughs> maybe I'm watching for murder in Skegness. Maybe, maybe that's why it never la it didn't last. Maybe. <laughs> I wonder, I wonder why she never returned my calls. That's why. Uh, there you go. <laughs> so wait, do you, <laughs> speaking of, um, is health and nutrition, is it important in, in what you do? Yeah, of course, absolutely. And, and in fact, actually, you know, I, 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 to help, because you know, I'm, I'm 45 in a few weeks and, and it's to try and stay in any sort of shape, I have to work out pretty much most days. Okay. Um, because my job again is demanding on, on, on my waistline. The fact that I have to, you know, I have to taste food all day long is my job. Mm -hmm. But I consider more now what I put in my body than ever before. 
And I think people, as the world you know, just gets bigger and the population gets bigger and the more information's out there with the, with, with the in internet, and people are more anxious today about what they put in their bodies than ever before. You know, workout in the last, you know, fitness in the last 10 years has boomed as an industry. I mean, it's multi-billion dollar industry mm -hmm. globally, and, and I think it's chefs would be foolish to ignore that. That's you know? right. Uh, and so, so yeah, of course, we try and keep out as much cream, butter. Uh, you know, we try and reduce our salt. Uh, but at the same time, some of those things make things taste good. Mm -hmm. So you've got to make sure you never sacrifice taste, because people might eat something and go, "Oh, that's really healthy for me," but it's really boring and bland. Yeah. So my job is to try and get that boring, bland thing to taste amazing but try and also make sure that it's as healthy as possible. It's possibly striking a delicate balance. Yeah, absolutely. Um, have you tried any of our, <coughs> have you been a, you know, are you adventurous first of all? Second, uh, in Cebu, have you gone on a food adventure? Like, have you tried Car Car Lechon? Mm -mm. Or have you been to Larshan? Oh gosh, yeah. <laughs> when I heard about Car Car Lechon, because that's where it existed, I, uh, we purposely made a trip to Car Car Market to go and buy it. Did you go yeah. early in the morning? Yeah, we did, yeah. And so, there was a massive queue on one of them and it was stinking hot. And we queued on that one, because there's the damn reason why someone's queuing in that queue, yeah. in that heat, for that particular lecture. And in the market, was, right? Yeah, and it was fantastic. With the drippings. Uh -huh. And then you laze your pusot with the <laughs> drippings. Oh my God. <laughs> not, not good for your health though. No. Yeah, but it's really good. Have you been to Larshan? Uh, Boya Bunda, who, uh, who we taped uh, last week, He's the Philippines king of talk talk shows. No? Okay. Uh, he's a mentor of mine. He loves going to Larshan, and it's a it's like a hawker place, and you know, it's not very clean, but it uh, there's barbecue there. Uh, Philippine Was he good? barbecue. Oh, I, I think we've it, been before, right? Larshan. Really? Oh, it's better now. Yeah. yeah, Gwen Garcia changed the no, and so all the mm. all the grills are centralized. So before you used to stink, right? You leave and you stink. Now, every, all the grills, they're centralized, so you eat uh, at the side and you can, you can leave and, you know, and go to another party. But it's amazing that someone like you, of your stature, has been to Larshan. Yep. <laughs> Have you been to Larshan? In fact, we filmed a TV show there for, for really? Sky. Really? They're very popular for, for that sauce, which you have to ask. Sometimes they don't give it to you. It's called Dicer. I don't know why. <laughs> um, it's the barbecue sauce that they... they yeah, and so you can. Uh, they wipe. I mean, you know, they they brush it with that sauce before they. they but you can ask for a separate cup, and then you mix it with your soy sauce and your chili mm -hmm. and your your calamansi, and it's just so good. Oh my gosh! Really? I go there sometimes at two a.m. alone just to eat by myself. <laughs> <laughs> so so you've tried Larshan? Oh yes, and, yeah, and, and, and uh, Car Car Lechon. Yep, yep. Uh, what else is good here? Balut, Balut, yeah. Yeah, we tried Balut, we've had, we tried that. In fact, we went out with Chris and Carla just the other night to um, How have, old? A, have a couple of beards. Uh, uh, I, I have no idea. Huh? The one with the chick? And we had, we had all my team here from London. They, mm -hmm. They've been here for a couple of weeks with the train. So all my main guys, you know, and they all wanted to try it. So uh, Dante, one of our, our boys, went off and got some. Okay. Brought it back and we, we, also, we, yes. we, we dished them all out. Mm -hmm. And uh, the only one who had the guts was naked all in one was Frankie, who runs Social Wine and Tapas, your, your, one of your favorite place. So Frankie took the whole thing down in one go, like a, sh a, sh a, a shot of tequila. I was very impressed. And you? Uh, no, I sniffed it, licked it, and then threw it away. <laughs> <laughs> oh. That's as good as it got for me, I'm afraid. Oh my goodness. But look, you have to <clears throat> drink the soup first. You open it, drink the soup, and it's oh so my good. Oh my goodness. And then I like it if you can see the chick with the, with the you know, with the, the oh feathers. Oh my gosh, it's getting worse. <laughs> next, next question. So you can't be on Fear Factor. Oh, no. They had that on Fear Factor. Do they? Yeah, they had Balut. I mean, because I can win that. <laughs> I can win, I can, it's just, it has very high cholesterol. Though. No, we have a show back home called I, I'm a Slip to Get Me Out of Here, and it's like, uh, my wife's often said, would you go on it? It's like, no chance. You know, they have, to, they have to eat, they send them to Australia to live in the jungle for, okay. for a couple of weeks. And then the British public vote them all off. They walk around with these silly t-shirts on with a number on the back and you have uh -huh. the telephone and vote them off. And they have to eat uh, witchery grubs and uh, all sorts of really horrible More jungle. Worms and yeah, stuff. all sorts Hakuna of horrible Matala. jungle. <laughs> they trap them inside a box and pour spiders on inside all their bodies. And it's like, oh my God, it's not for me. I've tried eating uh, like all the 
like worms and locusts and stuff. And if they're spicy, they're really good. Crunchy. Hakuna mm -hmm. <laughs> Matara. More, more food. Cebuano food and the pig and palm when Open Mic returns from the short break with Jason Atkins. Back here at Open Mic with Jason Atherton. So we were talking about like strange Filipino food, which isn't strange to us, but of course for foreigners, you know, it can be quite a, a different experience. Yeah. Have you tried like a, we love to eat internal organs. Yep. Uh, like uh, atay, liver, and you know, um, I love, actually like to eat chicken, the heart of the chicken. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, what's isao? Intestines, intestines. Intestines, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you I tried? mean, I mean, we have a very famous chef back home called Fergus Henderson, who mm -hmm. made nose to tail eating very famous amongst all the popular chefs. He has his own Michelin star. Very, very clever man. Cooks really amazing food from, you know, he's known to buy whole pigs and cook everything from the snout right down to the tail head, mm -hmm. you know, to nose to tail eating. Uh, so we've, you know, a lot of the younger chefs that might sort of my generation have taken over from that. And, you know, I'm very fond of cooking with, with you know, things from black pudding to we make our homemade haggis, which is uh, the insides and the intestines from the from the lamb. Oh, okay. Uh, much to my wife's distaste because she hates lamb. <laughs> um, I love lamb. And the um, uh, and it's so to cook with it is fascinating for a chef because only real foodies eat it. If that makes sense, mm -hmm. to sell it to the wider public. In fact, we did a very interesting study at Pollen Street which is my flagship restaurant in London. It's the first one that got the Michelin star. Yeah. And then we put a tasting menu on there with very unusual chefy food. And then we changed it a month later and they did the study of how many dishes of that we sold. Mm -hmm. And then the following month, because we have like a tasting menu and an a la carte, does that make sense? Yeah. And so the tasting menu that month when it was unusual food didn't sell that well. When we put the standard on there, which would be scallops, because everyone in Britain loves scallops, sea bass, everyone mm. loves sea bass, lamb because it's one of our national meats, it, and crab which is you know one of our, again one of our <coughs> famous shellfishes there. It was just, it, was, it went off the scale. Every table, you know, tasting menu, tasting menu, tasting menu, tasting menu, because it just shows that you know when you do really unusual things it's fantastic for your, not ego, but it's fantastic for you as a chef creativity wise, but for the actual consumer it's not so because it's mostly food is what like that. So it's mm. quite an interesting study. Um, have you tried durian, the fruit? Yes. And I can see why it's banned. <laughs> On subways and planes. <laughs> I've tried it three times. I've tried it. Peng Lo is one of my, me and my wife's business partners in Sydney and, and, and Shanghai. Um, he's fed it to me three times in his Chinese restaurant. Mm -hmm. And, um, the only Chinese restaurant in Singapore, and he's tried it with deep fried, uh, deep fried ice cream, durian okay. ice cream. Yeah, it's disgusting. <laughs> Fresh, disgusting, and then ice cream on its own, disgusting. I just can't. You can't. Some people, some people can just. My mm. first time to eat durian was at Carla's house, just a few weeks ago, because your mom. Uh, Tita Gwen, 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 Congresswoman Gwen Garcia, and uh, um, Chad, they were forcing me. And I said, no, no. They were all eating. And were, so eating durian with bubbly. I was like, no, I'm, no thanks. I can't. I can't. And then they said, please try it for us. So I had to cover my nose and I kind of, yeah, I enjoyed it. Really? <laughs> that was the first, that was the first time I tried. So tastes like, well, not that I eat old socks, but it tastes like old socks. <laughs> <laughs> It's amazing, but it's but it's, it's down to it's the cultural thing again. Where I, I have this, I have this thing I say right when I wake up in the morning, up until about eleven o'clock in the morning, I have to eat food what's very familiar to me as mm -hmm. my Western palate. Okay. So like you know, I'm a massive fan of Jason, Jason Hyatt here, who, who opens mm -hmm. up all the Abaca cafes Abaca, yeah. and stuff, and I just think he does a wonderful job with with his Western restaurants. They're just beautifully designed. Um, you know his food. His services are excellent. His service is fantastic. It's a it's a great price point. His product is is just second to none. And so when Abaca Cafe opened up, it was like heaven for me. The coffee was great. The pastries were amazing. And I could sit in there on my own quite happily and eat away, and I could be anywhere in the world, right? After eleven o'clock, I can try anything: fermented fish, spicy food, intestines, brain, 
I mean, LB in Spain, we used to work a lot with lamb brain, mm -hmm. with eucalyptus and, and, and blueberries. It's delicious. And so all this stuff, no problem. But that three hours in the morning from when I wake to when my tummy, I suppose, settles down, I just have to have what I'm used to. And it's the same thing, right? Because when you're brought up in this part of the world where durian is native, you can eat it because you're used to it. Not me, but <laughs> I just got <laughs> that. But it's not a strange thing, right? Yeah. Uh, but so I, I, I get the rituals, you know, because I, yeah. I also have that. I have to have my breakfast and my coffee, but it's it's more psychological, I guess. Yeah. Trying to trying to set you up for you know for the day. Yeah. Um, aside from aside from having to have what you normally have, um, drinks. Do you like uh, coffee? Do you have to have your coffee every day? Do you, yeah. Yeah, I'm, do you I'm, have I'm a big coffee fan. I mean, when hot we chocolate or uh, not not so much hot chocolate, but but when I um. When we launched our restaurant in Sydney a year ago now, um, people in Sydney are just absolutely crazy about coffee. I mean, I mean, you know, London's taken off, but my gosh, in Sydney, if you serve bad coffee, it's almost like a national crime. You know, mm -hmm. the, the, the Sydney side is so engrossed in everything what's good about coffee. I learned a lot down there about coffee. So I always have to have my coffee in the morning. You know, being British, I like a beer. Mm -hmm. You know, we were one of the first Michelin star restaurants to have an extensive beer list at, at Poland Street because I always looked at it this way. I'm a British chef, right? My roots are British. I'm British. I'm very proud of the beer we serve in the UK yeah. and what we brew. So why would I not want to serve it to my customers? Because yeah. in the old days in the UK, it was like if you came to a Michelin star restaurant, you would have to have a, a gin and tonic or a glass of champagne to start. And that would pretty much it. Mm -hmm. Well, it's ridiculous, <laughs> right? Because you're going out to have fun. So if you want to have a beer, okay, cool, have a beer. You know, we were literally just around the corner just now having a bit of lunch uh, from JY Square, and, and um, um, they serve this beer from Palawan I've never tasted before. From Palawan? Yeah, from Palawan. It's okay. fantastic. It's delicious. It's a little bit like a hogar. So we said straight away. Our bar, our, our, our executive bartender was there, uh, Jamie, who's now his job is to source this, and, and, and we'll get some for the pig and palm because I think it's cool that some beer comes from Palawan. Have you tried our red horse? Our oh, very yes. popular red horse. It's very strong. Very strong. I love it. I like it too. I you, Carla? Yeah. She likes it, so I drink with it. <laughs> I, I love Red Horse. I mean, it's a very... If you're from University of San Carlos, especially Talamban, you have to be a Red Horse drinker. <laughs> I'm, I'm from Talamban. Yeah. Partly Maine. Are oh, you from Maine? Wow. wow. <laughs> anyway, um, wine pairing. Yeah, uh, I think it's an art. It's uh, ancillary to the cooking itself. No? Yeah, that's very important. I think. I mean, yeah. the wine. You know, we have a wine list at Poland Street, which is always. You know, we're very lucky. It wins a lot of awards. So it's, um, it's a very expensive hobby to carry. I think. I think the wine list at Poland Street total value is probably nearly a million dollars US mm -hmm. dollars uh, uh, sat underneath the the restaurant, and it's. Um, with that comes great responsibility because there's some vintages there what you know in a lot of don't exist anymore you know yeah. and that, that our team of 10 sommeliers have to take care of it look after it turn it treat it and when guests order it serve it correctly properly and, and, and making sure that it's served with the correct dishes Paired on time properly, yeah. so yeah it's a real art form and, and to watch them work is like a ballet it's, 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 it's very nice um i'd like to clarify because a lot of people uh uh, are misinformed on this whole Michelin, Michelin, or how do you, yep. how do you pronounce it? Michelin. Michelin. Apparently. Yeah. <laughs> Some pronounce it Michelin, Michelin, yep. Michelin man. You uh -huh. know? Uh, he's like the marshmallow man. Uh, but that's really where it's from, yep. right? Uh, the Michelin guide. Um, but some people are misinformed. They think it's the chef who's awarded, but it's actually the chef's restaurant that's awarded, right? Absolutely. Well, the, the, the way it works, and I've had you know, so many meetings with Michelin over the time. Rebecca Burr is the editor of the UK Guide. So you know, I'll, I'll, I'll speak to Rebecca once a year um, just to talk about what her, because the thing is, it's a guidebook. Okay. Everyone gets obsessed by it, but it is a guidebook. And at the end of the day, it's supposed to guide you. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it gives it away in the title, right? It's yeah, a guidebook. Guide. So I always talk to Rebecca and, and, and say, you know, Miss Burr, what are your readers saying about my restaurants? Are they in tune? Uh, are we, have we had any negative comments? Are we having good comments? Are we on track? Is everything okay? And then she'll give me honest feedback from, not from her and her inspectors, but from what people are saying, because people write to the guidebook with recommendations, um, you know, bad service, bad food, great food, great service, and so forth and so forth. And that's how it is, because I treat it 
like any other marketing tool to my business. Yeah. Because first and foremost, a restaurant should always be a business. So Pond Street Social, yes, it's a Michelin star restaurant. Yes, it's got nine out of 10 of good food. Right? It's in the top three rated restaurants in, in Britain and, and you know highly regarded across the world. But that's secondary to the fact that I've got a business. It's a business. To pay 77 staff, half a million pound a year rent, all the produce, all the tax, you know, Theresa May's government, I was about to say David Cameron, uh, all, all, all that type of stuff. And, and it's all that is more important than if we're going to get our second star because I have to run my business properly, you know, first and foremost. And that to me is always crucial. And I teach all my guys around that globally, treat it like a business. If it's a good business and the food's great, like we know we can cook and the service is good, you will win awards, you will get on lists, you will do all that. You know? I'm sure you've had big names visit your restaurants, yep. the biggest names and you know, celebrities and sports stars, mm -hmm. uh, politicians. Who are the most memorable for you? Um, when we launched New York last year, Leonardo DiCaprio was there. Oh. Um, before the Oscar, after? Uh, before actually, <laughs> yeah. Before. Maybe you were lucky. Yeah, maybe. You were the lucky um, charm when you won the Oscar. <laughs> Hugh Jackman came just recently to Pollen Street with um, my one, my favourite actor Jack uh, Gyllenhaal. Um, oh, oh, I just Jake, think he's Jake, a yeah. uh, Jack. Uh, Jake, sorry, Jake Gyllenhaal. I just think he's a fantastic actor. We've had, gosh, every, you know, we're, we're so lucky. We've had so many uh, stars over the years come. Benedict Cumberbatch comes quite often. He's oh a person. I love him. He's a personal <laughs> friend of mine and Ira's. So, so he's a, um, he often comes. We. You know, you name it. We're, we're very lucky that we have Berners Tavern is uh, just a hub of, of who's who in the A-list of, of, of the UK and America. How has social media affected, you know, because now everyone posts their food. I think it's... Has it done... I think, you know, it's... it's has it done your business good? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, like, you know, you're, like, take Pig and Palm for a perfect example. We've just launched, we're three, four days old, something mm -hmm. like that. I've lost track of time. And everyone because, knows about it. And everybody knows about it. Well, if, if that, if... if if we were waiting for the newspapers to write about us in the days of, and I still remember, when mm. there was no mobile phones, exactly. there was none of that, you know, it was just, you were waiting for someone from the newspaper to come and write about your restaurant, so everybody knew about it, you know? I mean, it was something quite cute about that, but also there's something very delaying about it because there was no internet, no nothing. Where now, mm. you want to go to a nice, It's boom. instant. Yeah, you know, and there's I a saw, the I, I think you had some press people yesterday uh, uh, for lunch. No? Yeah. Even before they can write about it in the papers, I already saw their posts yeah. <laughs> uh, on their social media and their on Facebook. But before we close, maybe you can invite everyone to the Pig and Palm and, you know, and give give them a little something what they should expect. Well, I'm Jason Afton. I'm here for two weeks cooking at the Pig and Palm, our brand new restaurant. It's my love letter to my wife, Ira, who's a local Cebuana. So that's the real reason why you should support it. Come down and see us, <laughs> and I'll be cooking for you soon. All right. Thank you, Jason. Thank you for uh, being on the show. Thank, thank you. you to Carla Young McCohen, uh, our dear friend, uh, who arranged all of this, and of course, Ira, for visiting us. And my friends from our London based, the Del Valle couple. <laughs> thank you. Um, until next week, this has been another episode of Open Mic. I'm Mike Lopez. Good night and Godspeed. <laughs>